antinatalism and non-humans. There have been a couple of videos posted recently on antinatalism and animals. In particular, people are arguing that antinatalism includes animals or that it does not. I thought I would chip in. Problems with existing commentaries I watched a couple of videos on the topic. Unfortunately, all of them are wrong. Interestingly, they are wrong for the same reason. They are wrong because they try to argue for a specific definition of antinatalism based on personal opinions, biases and interests of their respective authors. And then they try to answer the question based on these idiosyncratic definitions. Why is it wrong? Because it's not exactly what philosophers are talking about when they discuss antinatalism. These videos miss the mark. They don't accurately capture what antinatalism as a philosophy is. My approach. My approach to the problem is as follows. I will not provide a definition of antinatalism. Attempts at providing short definitions for complex philosophical positions are not very fruitful. Sure, you can find definitions of transcendental idealism or existentialism in dictionaries. But I doubt you would get enough from them to answer very specific questions related to each of these views. Antinatalism is similar in this respect. It's a mistake to try to enforce a particular definition of antinatalism and to try to answer questions with it as the source of truth. Specifics of antinatalistic views vary across philosophers, which is why the claim that antinatalism includes animals is not entirely true. But also, the claim that antinatalism excludes animals is also not entirely true. It depends on the specific school of thought in the tradition. I will not answer the question who is included in antinatalism through my opinions. My opinions, my metaethics, my normative ethics, my views on positive obligations and my favorite arguments are not relevant. The opinions of various commentators on antinatalism are also not relevant. What is the source of truth? The published literature. I will present the views of antinatalist philosophers as they are, and the answers should emerge naturally. David Benatar. I'll start with the views of David Benatar, the most known, the most cited, and the most discussed antinatalist, who expressed his antinatalistic position in better never to have been. He is clear about one of his goals, to establish a specific moral or normative claim, a prohibition to have children. I shall argue that one implication of the view that coming into existence is always a serious harm is that we should not have children. He also explains that the same reasoning is applicable to all sentient beings. My argument applies not only to humans, but also to all other sentient beings. They exist in a way that there is something that it feels like to exist. In other words, they are not merely objects, but also subjects. This is because sentient existence comes at a significant cost. In being able to experience, sentient beings are able to, and do, experience unpleasantness. In the next paragraph, Benatar explains that he focuses on humans in the book because of practicality and because it's difficult for people to accept such arguments when they are applied to themselves. He expands on humans breeding animals in the lengthy footnote on pages 2 to 3, which he ends with, finally, the argument that animals are benefited by being brought into existence only to be killed ignores the argument that I shall develop in chapters 2 and 3, that coming into existence is itself, quite independently of how much 
the animal then suffers always a serious harm. Benatar strengthens his focus on sentient life rather than human life when he explains the asymmetry of distant suffering and absent happy people. He argues that we rightly do not feel sad that there are no Martians who could be living happy lives. Contrarily, if we knew there were Martians living very bad lives, we would rightly feel sorry for them. Benatar reinforces his commitment to his argumentation applying to animals and it having a moral, normative conclusion. Because my arguments apply not only to humans but also to other sentient animals, my arguments are also zoophilic in the non-sexual sense of that term. Bringing a sentient life into existence is a harm to the being whose life it is. My arguments suggest that it is wrong to inflict this harm. When Benatar invokes the term sentient, he really means to say that all types of sentient beings are harmed by coming into existence and that we should not bring them into existence. He writes, I have the same concerns about bringing conscious machines into existence as I do with bringing conscious humans or animals into existence. Benatar reinforces his views on animals when he discusses extinction, where he writes My arguments in this chapter and previous ones imply that it would be better if humans and other species became extinct. Julio Cabrera Cabrera dedicated a section on the question of animals in his book Malestar e Moralidade. He writes that Although animals suffer, including through human cruelty, and are mortal, just as we are, they do not suffer morally. Animals, argues Cabrera, are not subject to moral disqualification. They cannot fail as moral agents because they are not moral agents. And moral disqualification is an essential component of the structure of human life that devalues human life. Animals are not valueless in the same way as humans are. And ethics is applicable only in situations between morally disqualified beings, humans. So, he argues, we cannot establish ethical relationships with them, nor can we apply ethics to our behavior towards them. And this is the reason why he's against being an antinatalist with respect to animals. He writes, while we may feel sorry for the sufferings that the type of animal such as chickens, cows or birds will have when they are born, specifically their pain and discouragement coming from nature or humans, it would seem odd to have moral qualms about the birth of a non-human animal. For when they are cast into the world, they are not morally disqualified. There does not seem, therefore, to be a problem of procreation in the case of non-human animals, or reasons to be an antinatalist in the case of cats and dogs. The birth of a non-human animal is not as morally problematic as that of a human, or not at all. Karim Akerma, in Antinatalismus ein Handbuch, and in various essays, Akerma writes that since both humans and animals are capable of suffering, it's best to not bring any of them into existence. He writes, Antinatalists appeal to each individual not to produce any more humans and animals. He goes as far as to say that universal antinatalism aims at actively preventing other feeling creatures from coming into the world. Only human beings can be considered as addressees of the antinatalist moral theory, of whom, however, antinatalism also demands to, if possible, not allow any more animals capable of suffering to come into existence. This applies to agriculture as well as to wild animals, whose extinction must be initiated by sterilization in a way that is as painless as possible. He adds that he is in favor of extinction. In fact, I would be very much in favor 
of all animals capable of suffering becoming extinct. He is a proponent of universal antinatalism, a form of antinatalism that is concerned with every being capable of suffering. When constrained to animals, he would call this position animal antinatalism. Akerma also recognizes that by following the minimal ethical requirement of reducing suffering, we should be against bringing animals into existence as well as creating conscious machines. Other thinkers. The relation of antinatalism and animals was also brought up by others. In particular, Magnus Winding wrote The Speciesism of Living Nature Alone and the Theoretical Case for Wildlife Antinatalism, where he argues that the only thing that counts is someone's sentience and that we have obligations to help wild animals just as we have obligations to help people. In the case of animals, we could prevent many of them from coming into existence and reduce their populations. Similar arguments are made by Ludwig Rahl in his master's thesis Better Never to Have Been in the Wild, a case for weak wildlife antinatalism. And lastly, Bartłomiej Homański in Antinatalism and the Creation of Artificial Minds introduces anti-AI natalism, the view that we should abstain from creating sentient artificial intelligence. He invokes three arguments by Thomas Metzinger, John Basel and Sanders Beckers. Conclusions from the review. As we have seen, there is no single answer to the question are animals included in antinatalism? There are differences of opinions and arguments among antinatalists. Some of them are explicitly against being antinatalists with respect to animals. Some of them argue that for animals, just as for humans, it's better not to come into existence and we should not breed them. Some even argue that we have reasons to or obligations to intervene in nature, to decrease wild animals reproducing or even to sterilize populations. And finally, certain antinatalistic positions are universal, that is, they are about sentient beings in general, which includes not only humans and animals, but also possible conscious machines. Interpretation I'll share my short interpretation of what we've just seen. Moral claims often promote or restrict behaviors of moral agents with respect to moral subjects. We know of many moral prohibitions such as do not torture. A moral agent, usually a capable human being, should not torture moral subjects such as babies, cats, chickens, aliens, conscious AI or wild animals. This is perfectly understandable in many contexts, such as normal ethics, animal ethics, robot ethics and others. We see the same thing in antinatalism, where the prohibition is more akin to do not bring into existence or do not create moral subjects. There are, of course, exceptions, most notably Julio Cabrera and Peter Wesselzapfe. This only shows that there are differences in views among antinatalist philosophers. And this is not odd. On the contrary, this is normal in philosophy.